Anyway, uh, I was thinking this week about the internet and how amazing the internet is. Is anybody else amazed by the internet? Or have we just got to take it for granted now? But it is so amazing. Um, for anyone who is, I guess, my age or older, I know there are a few of you here, um, kind of live some of their life without the internet or a good portion of our lives without the internet. And um, before... Before that, if we needed to find out anything, we'd have to go to encyclopedias. We'd have to, go to the, you know, walk to the library, go to the reference section, try and find the index, say, okay, what are we looking at, and then go and find it. Or, or if you were lucky enough to have encyclopedias at home, you could look at But you remember there were was, was salesmen who used to knock on your door and sell you encyclopedias. Britannica, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, remember that, and you know, charge you lots of money for this big set of books that broke your shelves. I mean, literally, it was, that was how we found information. But now with a few clicks uh, of a mouse, it's all there in front of us. Um, we have instant access to a ridiculous amount of obscure information. Yeah. Just this week, uh, I was, we were having lunch. We were, we were away with Fru's family. We were having lunch. And I don't even know how the conversation got onto this, but somebody was asking whether pepper melts. <laughs> and so, and so, quick look on Google. You know, at what point, at what temperature does pepper melt? Because you can, right? Just whip out your phone, and you can find that kind of thing out. 130 degrees Celsius, if anybody's interested. Um, I don't even know why we were looking that up, but it's all there. So we've got all these billions and billions of bytes of data that's that's available to us. But it actually, fact, I was thinking it'd be all be useless if there wasn't some way of searching it. If there wasn't, and this is where kind of Google and search engines come in, because I don't know if you know how Google works, is they send these, what they call spider bots, they're auto automated spider or crawler bots that go around the internet, accessing, seeing all the information that's out there on the World Wide Web, and they kind of reference it and they tuck it away into like their digital filing cabinet, they know where it all is, so when you type in uh, uh, the boiling point of melting point of pepper it's already there with 50 million answers to what you need and so it's all about these these the, the possibility of searching it that's that makes it important uh, and if you couldn't search it all that information would be useless and why am I telling you this well there's a great paragraph that I read this week it was in one of my devotionals and it's Paul writing to the Corinthian church about the role of the Holy Spirit in our lives and this reminded me of Google. It said, the Spirit searches all things, even the deep things of God. For who knows a person's thought except their own spirit within them? In the same way, no, no one knows the thoughts of God except the Spirit of God. And I was thinking, actually, the Spirit is a bit like Google's spider bots. It's a bit like it, it gives you access to the mind and the thoughts and the power of God. And without the Holy Spirit, we wouldn't have that connection to God that we need and that helps us. And, and it's by the Holy Spirit that we get, we get this revelation and we get the information that helps us navigate our lives and produce the fruit that we are supposed to produce. Which leads us nicely to our new series, The Orchard. Um, the big idea is that as believers, we are supposed to uh, demonstrate and produce fruit in our lives. Uh, we are fruit trees uh, and our lives should look different because we have the Holy Spirit in us. Our behaviours and our choices and the way we act and the way we speak should look different if we have the Holy Spirit inside of us. Uh, and so this is a series that's going to focus on the fruit of the Spirit. Uh, I don't know if you know these, you find them in Galatians. Paul writing to the Galatians spoke about love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. Those are the nine fruit of the Holy Spirit. Those are the things that we should be demonstrating when we've got the Holy Spirit in us. Those are the things that the Holy Spirit develops in us and out of the behaviors that the Holy Spirit brings to the front and should separate, it should make us look different to other people who don't have the Holy Spirit. Um, and it's why Jesus said to his disciples when he was about to be crucified and go away from them, he said to them, it's better if I go away, you can read this in John, it's better if I go away because if when I go away, I'm going to send the Holy Spirit to you. So Jesus was saying, it's better for me to go and send you the Holy Spirit because uh, with me here, you kind of have a, a connection with God, but with the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit's in you and that gives you, gives you complete access, connection, whole connection to God via the Holy Spirit. This is better, better by far. 
So what we need to do now is to learn to listen. We need to learn how to walk and to keep in step with the Holy Spirit and be aware of the Holy Spirit's voice and start to recognize the Holy Spirit's voice. Just like uh, Fru recognized the Holy Spirit's voice this morning when she brought that word. We need to all learn to, to, to walk in step with the Spirit a little bit more because we don't start with the fruit, we start with the Spirit. So I've called this message today, um, Start Listening for a Change. Start listening for a change. Because it's when we learn to listen and it's when our ears are open, our minds are open and our, and, our, and our spirit within us is open to the prompting of the Holy Spirit that our lives will change and those behaviours will come to the fore. Now as it happens, today is uh, Pentecost Sunday, I don't know if you knew that, uh, where we celebrate the coming of the Holy Spirit uh, in, that for, in the early church in Acts chapter 2. Uh, today is uh, Pentecost Sunday. Um, and it's, we celebrate uh, the empowering of the church to fulfill the mission that God had uh, given us. So we're not going to start with the fruit. Um, there's plenty of time to look into that in the coming weeks. We've got nine more weeks of this series. And each week we're going to take a different one of the fruit of the Spirit. Um, so starting with love and then joy and then peace and etc. Et and we're not going to start with Pentecost either. Because that would be like jumping into uh, an epic novel kind of ten pages from the end. Because the Spirit didn't just come into the, into the earth on that day of Pentecost. The Spirit has, has been around forever. All the way through Scripture we read about the Holy Spirit. From the very first paragraph, the Holy Spirit is mentioned. The very last paragraph, the Holy Spirit is mentioned. And all the way through, more than 800 times, the Holy Spirit is mentioned throughout Scripture. So we're going to go back. I'm going to go right through the story of Scripture and the Holy Spirit. Is that all right? We've done this kind of before uh, a year or two ago, but I think it's worth remembering and reminding ourselves of, of kind of the Holy Spirit's role in humanity. So, back at the beginning, Genesis chapter 1, verse 1 says, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep. And then it comes in, the Holy Spirit, it says, was hovering over the waters. The Holy Spirit is there right at the beginning, hovering over the waters. And that word hovering is the Hebrew word rahab. Rahab, which means it's kind of trembling. It's got this energy. It's, it's shaking. It's like the first rumblings of an earthquake. I don't know if anybody was uh, aware of the thunderstorm last night. Yeah. When you can, feel, you can feel the whole world kind of shaking. You're not directly in it, but you, it, it's all there. Or, or if you've been on an aeroplane, when the aeroplane has taxied to the beginning of a runway, and you're sat there, and then suddenly the jet engines start to roar. And in that moment, you just feel that energy, that pure energy, before you shoot down the runway and take off, and it pushes you back in your seat. The Holy Spirit is, is hovering, it's trembling over the water, over the surface of the water. Something is about to happen. And you know what, the, what happens next. The next line, and God said. God spoke. And so we've got the Spirit of God, and then you've got the Word of God. And it's these two things. It's like a, some kind of chemical reaction, this, this uh, explosive reaction. The Word of God and the Spirit of God and the whole of creation comes forth. He said, God said, let there be light, and there was light. And so God makes the, the light and the darkness and the sky and the water and the land and the sea and the sun and the moon and the stars and the birds and the fish and all the creatures are made. And God looks at all these things that have been made by the Word of God and the Spirit of God and he sees it all and he says that is good that is good and then he does something a little bit different he he decides to make uh, mankind he says let us make mankind in our image so there's a there's a community about God God the Father the Son and the Holy Spirit let us make man in our image in our likeness so that they may rule and we are told that he forms man from the dust. And then does something that he didn't do at all to anything else in all creation. Not to any of the creatures. Not to any of the life. He does something brand new. He, he bends down and he breathes into the man. And what he's doing there, he's breathing the Holy Spirit into mankind. The power of God comes into mankind. And man, and mankind, and humankind 
exist with the Holy Spirit inside them. This Holy Spirit that had been instrumental, that had brought life to all creation, is actually breathed into humankind. And we're enabled to have this perfect relationship, this perfect connection with God the Father. And God looks at humankind and he says, well, all that other stuff, that was good. But this, this is really good. He says it's very good. This is a whole other level. There is nothing else like people on the planet. And most theologians and philosophers agree that uh, man, a human, are made uh, with uh, a physical body, but also a, um, a, an immaterial, a being, the soul, the spirit as well. But from this biblical description of creation, we also understand that there is a, there's a third part to us. This third compartment, if you like, that's, that's there for the Holy Spirit to exist in us. And that's the life that God was breathing into us. And together, Adam and his wife, Eve, as vessels of the Spirit, they experience this perfect relationship with the Father. And then we know what happens. Uh, they are tempted. The serpent comes into the garden and he tempts them and they eat of the tree that God told them not to eat. He said, if you eat of this tree, you will die. And they do it and sin enters the world. And that sin leads to shame. But it also leads to this loss of connection because the Holy Spirit can't exist in a place of sin. The sacred and the profane can't. They can't exist together. And so mankind loses the Holy Spirit in that moment. And for the rest of his existence, or for the rest of Adam and Eve, they have to exist on the planet without the Holy Spirit, without that connection uh, to God. And they experience a kind of a spiritual death that God told them they would. And they also have to leave the garden, which means they're also going to experience a physical death as well. So now man, who had been uh, created with these three parts, the body, the soul, and the Holy Spirit, now has to live his life on earth without the Spirit's presence. And over the next 2,000 years, uh, we read through Scripture, through the book of, uh, actually just the first few chapters of Genesis, uh, we read how man kind of descends more and more into sin. And then in chapter 6, we read about uh, the flood and God uh, you know, trying to redeem mankind through the man Noah and then we go a few more chapters chapter 11 we read about um, how mankind they said they they moved into the plain and they find this great place this open place and they start to build a city and in this city of Babel they want to build a tower you all know the story of Babel they want to build a tower and it's not in any way to glorify God it's to glorify themselves it actually uh, says uh, so that we may make a name for ourselves and it says at that moment that the world had one language and a common speech. So the cleverness of man, that they've all got one language and they're able to do this thing where they build a tower. But because of their heart, because of the pride that is in their heart, God thwarts it. And the way he thwarts it is by taking away the common language and separating them and gives them all different languages. And now they can't communicate. So not only now have they lost their connection with God, but they kind of lose their connection with other people as well because they know can't talk together and, and mankind separates across the world. And it's at this point in history that man's plan to restore things begins to take shape. We see him, he takes this man Abraham and he's a righteous man and he says through you Abraham, he said I'm going to bless you and through you all people will be blessed. So it's not just about you, eventually this is going to lead to the blessing of the whole world. Uh, but right now let me tell you I'm going to make you into a nation. And Abraham has a son, Isaac, and Isaac has a son, Jacob, and Jacob, uh, God gives Jacob the name Israel. And so for the rest of the Old Testament, we now follow Israel and his descendants who we called the nation of Israel. So 600 years later, they're in, they're, 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 they've been living in Egypt and they've been slaves for a few hundred years, and God thinks, well, now is the time to redeem them from slavery. And so he sends his servant Moses to go before Pharaoh and he sends plagues. You've all seen the film Prince of Egypt. And uh, all these plagues happen and Pharaoh says, no, 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 you can't go. And then we know there's this moment, this night that becomes to known as uh, Passover. And on Passover, uh, the angel of death comes throughout the land of Egypt and the firstborn, his life is taken from them, every, uh, the firstborn of every home. Except for the people, the nation of Israel, who paint their doorposts with the blood of a spotless lamb. And anybody, any home that has this blood on the lintels and the doorpost, 
the angel of death passes over. It's incredible. And, and eventually Pharaoh says, yes, you can now go. And they go, and, and God says to them, you can go, but you've got to remember this day. This day we call Passover because the angel of death passed over. You've got to remember it every single year. It's really important that you remember this day. And they go through the Red Sea, and we know that Pharaoh's armies are destroyed in the sea. And then just a few weeks later, seven weeks later, 50 days later, later they've just experienced this great miracle 50 days later Moses is up on the mountain he's getting the tablets of stone with God's commands etched on them but now Moses has been gone for so long for 40 days and the children of Israel they're getting all antsy oh you know maybe Moses is dead he's not coming back so they say to Aaron Aaron make us an idol make us a god that we can follow and so he does, and he takes all their gold jewelry, and he fashions this golden calf that they begin to worship. So Moses comes down the mountain, and he's like, what are you doing? Seven weeks ago, you saw God part the sea. He brought you out of slavery. What are you doing? And in that moment, he, the, the tribe of Levi he says they strap on swords, and, and there is kind of judgment takes place, and 3,000 people die. On that day, 3,000 people die because of what they were doing. This is the day that Moses gave the command, that, sorry, that God gave the commandment through Moses. And this is the day of Pentecost. Pente because it's 50 days, 50 days after Passover. That's where the name comes from. So the day that God sends the law and 3,000 people die. Over the next few hundred years, we read that God sends his Holy Spirit on various people at various times. It's no longer that dwelling of the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit can't dwell in people. But he does come on certain people for a certain season, for a specific task. And, uh, you know, for prophecies and for, you know, on Samson, on Gideon, the Spirit comes on it, and on David. But just for, just for a time, it's no longer dwelling in mankind because of sin. And eventually the sinfulness of Israel leads to... Uh, God sending other nations to conquer Israel, the uh, Persians and the Medes and the Assyrians and the Babylonians and then the Romans. And throughout this dark time where the nation of Israel is defeated and they've been exiled and they've been invaded and they've been occupied, throughout this time God is sending prophets to, to tell them, look, there's going to be a change. A Messiah will come. A Savior will come. And so there's this hope that one day a king like David will come back and he will get rid of all these invading armies and restore things to how they should be. They think it's going to be a king like their favorite King David who's going to come and change things. And then we tip over into the New Testament. And this young girl, Mary, who's a virgin, receives a visit from an angel who says to her, the Holy Spirit will come on you. And the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. So the Holy Spirit plants the Son of God inside Mary. And Jesus is born. And Jesus, the light of the world, comes into the world. And everything begins to change. He grows up and he's about to start his ministry. But first... He knows he needs to do something. We read this in Luke chapter 3. It says, when all the people were being baptized, Jesus was baptized too. And as he was praying, heaven was opened and the Holy Spirit, again, the Holy Spirit descended on him in bodily form like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, you are my son whom I love. With you I am well pleased. But because of Jesus' sinless nature, because he wasn't born of a man, he was born of the Holy Spirit, he doesn't have that original sin inside of him. So now the Holy Spirit can inhabit Jesus, and he, and he does his ministry in communion, in perfect communion, that connection with God because he is sinless. And over the next three years, he calls his disciples to follow him. And over time, his disciples become convinced that this guy is the Messiah. And they thought, here we go. This is it. The Messiah is here. We're about to conquer the Roman invaders. We're about to get rid of them out of our land. We're going to restore everything to how it should be. We're going to be a mighty land again. But Jesus, he begins to explain to them that's, that, that's not the plan at all. 
That's not what the Messiah is going to do. That's not how it's going to work. He actually tells them, I'm going to be taken from you. In fact, I'm going to be killed. And they're like, what? That can't be. That's not how we see this playing out. But he says, I'm going to go. But then I'm going to send the Holy Spirit. Who's going to dwell in you? And this, guys, is a game changer. This is a game changer for you. The advocate, the comforter, the guide, the spirit of truth. And we know how it plays out during the week where they're remembering Passover. They're celebrating Passover still. Thousands of years later, like God has told them to, they're celebrating Passover and Jesus is arrested and he's crucified. And he actually fulfills the whole Passover deal. He becomes the spotless lamb who takes away the sin of the world. He does that. He fulfills everything. This is why God told them to remember Passover because it will point to what Jesus is doing at this moment. And you know what Jesus said on the cross? He said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Because when all the weight of sin went on to him, in that moment he lost that connection to God because the Holy Spirit, sin, they can't exist in the same place. And then Jesus is resurrected three days later. In this space of the next 40 days, he appears to his disciples, he appears to lots of people, and he gives them a mission, and he tells them to wait in Jerusalem for the Holy Spirit that's going to empower them to do this mission. They're going to God-given power to fulfill their God-given mission. So 50 days after Passover, we come to Pentecost. Jerusalem is filled with people from all over the world. These are God-fearing people, but they're all gathered in Jerusalem to celebrate Pentecost the day when the law was given. And God chooses this day to send his Holy Spirit back. Perhaps you know the story, you can read it all about it in Acts 2, where they're they're waiting and they're praying, and then the Holy Spirit comes and there's tongues of fire, and they start to speak in languages, in different languages that they don't know. It's all empowered by the Holy Spirit. And it says that people can understand what they're saying. And when the New Testament talks about being filled with the Holy Spirit. He used this word, a uh, Greek word, pleru, pleru, which means filled. Now this word also means fulfilled. When Jesus says, I have not come to abolish the law, but to fulfill the law, that's the same word when it's talked about the Holy Spirit coming. Because the Holy Spirit doesn't just fill us, it fulfills us, it completes us. Suddenly that third compartment that has been empty for all those thousands of years, It's now full again. And we're made whole. And by the Holy Spirit's power, we're made complete. And we have that connection to God again. So on this Pentecost day, the Holy Spirit comes like a rushing wind. There's all these signs and wonders. And they start to speak in other tongues. And this brings unity. Because people can now understand what is being said. People say that we hear them speaking in our language. There's loads and loads of different languages and suddenly they can hear it all. And so Peter, filled and fulfilled by the Holy Spirit, starts to talk to the crowd. He brings in various passages of scripture from the Psalms and from the prophet Joel. And so he's filled with the Holy Spirit and then he's speaking the word of God. And suddenly you have this explosive mixture again. The word of God and the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God, come together. And all of a sudden on this day... You have life, just like in Genesis. And he reminds him of God's promise through the prophet Joel. He says, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Everyone. It's everyone. It's for everyone. It's for the whole world. This is not just a blessing on one nation like they thought. This is a blessing for the whole world. They're finally beginning to understand it's not just for Israel. And this is the kingdom that Jesus has been talking about for the past three years. There's not going to be a king, uh, conquering King David like we thought. They are going to conquer the world, but not in that way. They're going to conquer it through love. From Ju- Jerusalem to Judea, to Samaria, and to the ends of the world. And then it says in Acts 2.41, he says, this is amazing. Those who accepted his message, this is Peter, were baptized. About three thousand were added to their number that day do you see it in Eden 
When Adam and Eve sinned, they lost the Holy Spirit and they experienced that death. On Pentecost, because of what Jesus had done, the Holy Spirit returns and humanity you now experiences that connection and life. In Babel, God's cause, the language is to, to divide humanity from one another and that loss of connection with people. On this new Pentecost, the Holy Spirit came and drew people together and created unity and understanding. And on the original Pentecost, when the law was given on that day, and 3,000 people died on this new Pentecost when the Holy Spirit came, and 3,000 people find life. It changes everything. And this is our reality now, life with the Holy Spirit, life through the Holy Spirit. And just for the last few minutes, I want us to see five things that the Holy Spirit does in us and with us and through us. Five things, very quickly. The Holy Spirit gives us a new conviction. He gives us a new connection. He gives us a new circumstance. He gives us a new calling. And he gives us a new character. I must be a proper preacher because they all begin with the same letter. So our journey with the Holy Spirit starts with a new conviction. Just like on the day of Pentecost when Peter stood up and preached to the crowd, what he does is remind them of of what they did to Jesus, remind them of the prophecies from the Old Testament. And what do we read happens? Because when the people heard this, they were cut to their heart and they said to Peter and the other apostles, brothers, what shall we do? There's a conviction that takes place via the Holy Spirit inside them. The power of the Holy Spirit brings conviction. And Jesus, a few weeks earlier, talking to his disciples, put it like this. He said, when he comes, talking about the Holy Spirit, he will convict the world of sin and of God's righteousness and of the coming judgment. It starts, the Holy Spirit's role in us starts with a new conviction. If you haven't given your life to Jesus, maybe the Holy Spirit is talking to you now and convicting something inside you, telling you that you need to do that. Because it starts with a new conviction. And then it moves on to a uh, a new uh, connection. On On Pentecost, Peter told the crowd what they need to do. He said, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So it starts with a conviction. And then it moves to a connection. When you respond to the conviction, you receive the Holy Spirit, which gives you that divine connection again between you and God, that broadband connection, that always-on connection so that you can hear God's voice. You can know the mind of God in your heart. It's a whole other level. That's why Jesus said it's better if I go and send this to you. He also said this, on that day you will realize that I am in my Father and you are in me and I am in you. That connection. The Holy Spirit brings a new connection. No one knows the thoughts of God except the Spirit of God. We need the Spirit of God so we can access those deep things of God. He also, the Holy Spirit, not only connects us to God, He connects us to each other. Because uh, Jesus is the vine and we are the branches and we connect as branches, we connect through the vine to one another and the Holy Spirit brings a, a connection to our brothers and sisters. Why do we call each other brothers and sisters? Because of that connection that we have uh, together. So we have a new conviction, a new connection uh, and out of that connection we get a new circumstance. This is a new identity, a whole new you. We've been transplanted from our old life and brought into a new life. We've spent the whole of the last few weeks looking at this, right? Looking at our identity, looking at who we are in Christ Jesus. Uh, Romans 8 says the Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. The Holy Spirit is in you and he's telling you all the time, you're a child of God. You're a child of God of God. You are an adopted heir of the Son of God. Of God. So you're adopted heir. You're brothers with one another. You're brothers with each other. You are an heir and you have an inheritance. We have a new name. We have a new identity. We have a new conviction, a new connection, a new circumstance. And the Holy Spirit gives us a new calling as well. He gives us uh, purpose. He gives us gifts. He gives us power that gives us that purpose. Paul writing to the Corinthians said, there are different kinds of gifts, but the same Spirit distributes them. There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord. There are different kinds of working, but in all of them and in everyone, it is the same 
God at work. So we have this new calling by the Spirit who given us uh, these gifts in us. He equips us to fulfill our purpose. And then finally, we have a new character as well. And this is where we're going to be placing our focus over the uh, next nine weeks. As a church, we're going to be refining our character as we learn to recognize, as we learn to listen to the Holy Spirit who is in us, as we learn to recognize his voice and walk in step with the Spirit. We're going to experience a new character. We're going to experience uh, and, and uh, be giving out the love that comes by this new spirit, the joy and the peace and the patience and the kindness and the goodness and the gentleness and the faithfulness and the self-control. The Holy Spirit at work in us, it makes us better. It doesn't make me better than you or anybody else. It makes me better than me. Me with the Holy Spirit is better than me without the Holy Spirit. Empowering me to make better choices, not being swept along by my feelings, enabling me to be a blessing to those around us. But we have to choose the path. We have to choose to walk the path. It's not something that the Holy Spirit does in us without us uh, choosing to walk that path. Uh, Paul, writing to that Galatians, I think it's in the same chapter, he says, you can choose. He says, you can walk according to your flesh, or you can walk according to your spirit. You can walk according to your desires and the sin that kind of you're tempted to do, or you can walk according to the spirit. We have to choose to walk in line with the spirit's will, and for that we need to recognize his voice and listen for a change. The Spirit searches all things, even the deep things of God. I think I'd like to um, finish with a song, if that's all right. Um, and it's the song, or just the chorus of, Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. Maybe that can be our response. Holy, when we sing it, I know usually we sing that song, Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. We kind of think of the room that we're in, or the place, or the building that we're in. But actually, I want us to think of it in terms of, Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. You are welcome here. I want you to change me, to change my mind.